friends in this course on philosophy and aesthetics for the postgraduate students in uh, visual arts we have already discussed the psychoanalytical theory and the aesthetic interpretations done using that theory quite extensively but this theory and its effect kept lingering in 20th century also so in today's session we are going to focus the later developments of the theory of psychoanalysis and the uh, 20th century scholars who have contributed to it rhetoricians and philosophers since aristotle have examined the psychological dimensions of literature and art ranging from the author's motivation and intentions to the effect of text and performance on an audience the application of psychoanalytic principles to the study of the arts and literature however is a relatively recent phenomenon initiated primarily by sigmund freud whom we have already discussed and in other directions by adler and carl jung then notions of the unconscious was not in itself new and it can be found in many thinkers prior to freud notably the romantics such as schlegel or schopenhauer and in nietzsche the unconscious is a deeper layer of human psyche away from reason that tends to affect our judgment and action without our knowledge of the source freud's fundamental contribution was to open up the entire realm of unconscious to systematic study and to provide a language and terminology in which the operations of the unconscious could be expressed the positioning of an unconscious as the ultimate source and the explanation of human thought and behavior represented a radical disruption of the mainstream of western thought which since aristotle had held that man was essentially a rational being capable of making free choices in the spheres if intellection and morality to say that the unconscious governs our behavior is to problematize all of the notions on which philosophy theology and even literary criticism have conventionally rested the ideal of self knowledge the ability to know others the capacity to make moral judgments the belief that we can act according to reason that we can overcome our passions and instinct the ideas of moral and political agency intentionality and the notion held for centuries that literary creation can be a rational process in a sense freud postulated that we bear a form of otherness within ourselves <laughs> we cannot claim fully to comprehend even ourselves why we act as we do why we make certain moral and political decisions why we harbor given uh, religious dispositions and intellectual orientations even when we think we are acting from a given motive we may be deluding ourselves and much of our thought and action is not freely determined by us but driven by unconscious forces which we can barely fathom moreover far from being based on reason our thinking is ultimately dependent upon the body upon its uh, instincts of survival and aggression as well as obstinate features that cannot be dismissed as in the cartesian tradition where the mind is treated as a disembodied phenomenon such as its size color gender and social situation the fact that if i am a black working class female will determine my world view just as much and perhaps far more than anything else i consciously learn in the realm of ideas contemporary views on freudian theory while freud's theories have been widely criticized it is important to remember that his work made important contributions to the psychology and literary theory and understanding the origin of artist aesthetic pursuits his work sparked a major change in how we view mental illness by suggesting that not all psychological problems have physiological causes many psychoanalytical terms such as defense mechanism freudian slip and the retentive have become a part of our everyday language many of his interpretations have later led to the evolution of many art movements such as surrealism
Surrealist theory was based on a simplistic understanding of the writing of Sigmund Freud's recrafted for the use of poets and visual artists. Thanks to surrealism, Freud became popularized by, by the 1930s and his impact upon the artists in Paris in 1920s. For the artist, the mind of human psychology could be a source of artistic inspiration. For Freud, the unconscious is structured like a language that cannot speak its name. Like an undeveloped photograph, the content of the mind are latent, speaking in the secret language that is wholly private and individual. Surrealism sought this secret language through the fixing of the dream images into works of art. But there was another element of Freudian theory that found its way into surrealistic art. The concept of automatic writing. The essential discovery of surrealism is that without preconceived intentions, the pen that flows in order to write and the pencil that runs in order to draw or spin an infinitely precious substance. Resembling doodling or idle scribbling, a creature, automatic, was a loosening of control of a conscious thought on the part of the poet. For the painter, such as John Miro or the assemblage artist, such as Max Ernst, the result was a combination of free association and stream of consciousness. Writing, Freudian thought, is still quite relevant in art theory today. We should uh, uh, shift our focus to another important scholar in this realm, that is Carl Jung, who lived from 1875 to 1961. The Swiss psychiatrist, the deaf psychologist, founder of the school of thought termed analytical psychology. It was in 1907 that Jung and Sigmund Freud first met in Vienna. And Jung became interested in Freud's work in psychoanalysis. By 1909, however, the two men had experienced a rupture after an extended residence together at Clark University in, in Massachusetts. And by 1913, they had broken definitively following the publication of Jung's Transformation and Symbols of the Libido, renamed Symbols of Transformation. There were three fundamental reasons for the split. First, Jung was unable to accept Freud's concept of libido as being limited to sexual energy, believing instead in an energizing theory based on a principle of opposites. Jung conceived of the psyche as a dynamic, self-regulating system whose energy or libido grows out of tension that flows between two opposite poles. To discover what something means, one must constantly attend to its obverse opposite. The second major point of contention between Freud and Jung concerned the way the unconscious content was to be interpreted symbolically. Whether as the soul's reflection of the personal conflict or as the manifestation of a collective aspect of the individual psyche, whose contents are repeated through myriad uh, universal myths, Freud could not formally embrace this view, mostly because he saw, it, uh, saw in it an implicit admission of inherited racial experiences. Jung, However, it did not mean to imply that experiences as such as inherited. Rather, he fathomed a deeper structure of the unconscious that the personal unconscious, the dwelling places of instinctive impulses to action shaped and influences by the experiences of mankind and womankind of course, but which can become manifest only through individual experience and so appear as individual acquisitions. Finally, disagreements that occurred during the mutual analysis of dreams brought an end to the relationship between Freud and Jung. Jung made the unconscious comprehensible in terms of spiritual quest of mankind. For him, its depths 
are not always dark and negative as they are to Freud. Although the unconscious extends into lower layers of one's animal nature, Jung believed that it also reached up, out and beyond to a higher dimension of being. It is not merely the repository of everything objectionable, infant, infantile, even animal in ourselves, but the ever creative principle in a person's life. Jung initially wanted to call his own school of thought complex psychology before he named it analytical psychology, demonstrating the importance he attributed to this aspect of the psyche. He defined complexes as psychic entities which are outside the control of conscious mind. They have split from the consciousness and led a separate existence in the dark realm of the unconscious. Being at all times ready to hinder or reinforce conscious functioning. Complexes then are two-faced. They can produce totally opposite effects, be evil or good, destructive or constructive. The aspect they show depend largely on the conscious attitude and how they affect a person's capacity to understand the moral evaluation. Jung uses the term individuation to refer to the gradual lifelong process of balancing and harmonizing the individual psyche so that consciousness and the unconscious ultimately come to complement and compensate one another. The vehicle of individuation can be a dream or any fantasized image which the individual is asked to describe or elaborate in any number of ways. Dramatic, dialectic, visual, acoustic or in the form of dancing, painting, drawing or modeling. Individuation which develops most noticeable in the second half of the life can also be construed as quest of self-realization, an archetypal collective psychic process that enabled the individual to experience his or her spiritual life. As such, it is a key to the interpretation of world religions, myths and philosophies. Jung sees a similarity between the inner transformation in individuation and religious conversion. Individuation is sometimes described as a psychological journey towards self-discovery that cannot occur without suffering. It can at times seem to take a circuitous path and lead in circles or more accurately in spirals. The process begins with a wounding of the conscious personality when a person first has an inkling that there exists a shadow complex or the dark, negative and inferior side of the personality. The sum of those unpleasant qualities usually hidden and the other side of the behavior that have been cultivated within consciousness. One must learn to live with this often terrifying aspect of oneself for there is no psychic wholeness without a recognition and assimilation of opposites. The confrontation which the shadow perforce entails dissolution of the persona or the conscious ideal of the personality, the mask worn in one's daily intercourse in the society. The journeyer will also meet with the archetypes of the unconscious and face the danger of succumbing to the peculiar fascination of these uh, primordial factors. Uniform and regularity recurring models of apprehension. In particular, he or she will encounter respectively the anima or animus archetype. The complementary feminine element contained in the unconscious of a man or the masculine element found in the unconscious of a woman. These principles of femaleness and maleness are not to be confused with femininity or masculinity inherently characterizing women or men, but should be construed instead of symbolic images association, for example, with the ancient Chinese concept of yin and yang, or with the modern uh, Jungian constructs of eros and logos. Eros, for Jung, is association with the connective quality of relationship, while Logos with that discrimination and cognition. 
after the anima and animus the two archetypes that are likely to exert influence on a man's or woman's life are the old wise man and the great mother these can appear in various other forms in a man for instance as a king or a hero medicine man or a savior trickster or a mighty man for example magicians or devil and in a woman as an earth mother or the primordial mother for example a witch <coughs> when these archetypes are awakened a man or a woman may come to believe that he or she really possesses the mana or the seemingly magical power and wisdom they hold jung terms possessions by these archetypes inflation which involves an extension of the personality beyond individual limits in other words a state of being puffed up nevertheless the feeling of omnipotence that comes through inflation is an illusion and can uh, uh, compel a person to overestimate his or her strength and capacity one does not really possess or suppose the wisdom of superhuman god or spirit or demon in the case of man or an over overprotective or tyrannical mother figure in case of women both manifestations are in fact voices from the unconscious that need to be consciously apprehended and understood for their true value to become accessible because of the danger of possession and of inflation jung says that one of the fundamental aims of individualization is to divest the self or the suggestive power of primordial images ideally in the end if they are fortunate a man or woman will succeed in reconciling the opposing elements in their beings and such integration can be formulated as the finding of the god within or as the apprehension of the archetype of wholeness the self phrases such as totality the center of personality and the wholeness capture the essence of selfhood during the crucial stages of individuation jung observes there is often an important association between an inner thought vision dream or premonition and an outer event that may pass unnoticed because considering the psychic relativity of space and time such a connection is not even conceivable more to the point the individual has not yet learned to be aware of the uncanny type of meaningful coincidence and to make the necessary connection the term synchronicity is used to describe the existence of significant relationship between inner and outer events that are not themselves casually linked but to the apprehension in the final analysis enables a woman or man to be most fully interrelated and interconnected as a human being and to experience the mysterious ecstasy of selfhood and its most transcendent form jung himself used his study of mythology and art and created a book of his own where he explored his inner life through study and art he was very much influenced by the romantics and the symbolist
the psychoanalysis as a theory makes its presence felt in the 20th century the language of dream is later elaborated by laka as uh, the process through which artistic creation takes place as well we have discussed laka in the other modules and that is why we will briefly discuss another important scholar who tried to fathom the process of signification relying on various theories like freudian psychoanalysis socio semiotics and laka's deliberations on id and ego that is julia kristeva julia kristeva she focuses on the process of signification she has tried to uh, use this uh, theory of psychoanalysis to understand the human expression in any of the languages including the verbal and the visual languages so language which is a process of signification which she believes is not fully logical as most of the people believe so there she owes she, a lot to the theory of psychoanalysis she says that subject is constituted through and threatened by the logic of signification so which means that signification certainly has a bearing of logic in it without logic the signification is not possible and the interpretation of signification is impossible without the logical base but at the same time there is a large part of it which is beyond logic signification emerges out of the dialectical interaction between the symbolic and the semiotic according to julia kristeva now here the word semiotic has nothing to do with semiotics though she certainly certainly owes a, a lot to semiotics here she is using these terms semiotic and symbolic with a different connotation symbolic is the intentional logical part of the signification every signification is twofold the symbolic part is intentional it is logical and obviously meaningful which is which can which can be easily interpreted because it has a certain rational behind it the semiotic part is more intuitive and overtly in unintentional uh, we do not know it appears to be unintentional but there could be some hidden intention behind it as uh, freud always believed so that intuitive part of of the signification which is which doesn't have any single commitment to a specific meaning we know that the logic defines the meaning of the signification but in every signification there are some unfathomable parts that part that unintentional intuitive part of signification is the semiotic uh, part so this this part is always polyphonic because it cannot be the meaning of that particular aspect cannot be derived solely depending on the logic this semiotic cora is an imaginary space which can be compared to a womb and the dialectic interaction between the symbolic and the semiotic according to julia kristeva takes place in the womb it is a very simplistic understanding of that theory but i am trying to uh, explain it to you the and this interaction gives birth to the text now the text too she tries to visualize it on two levels one is the genotext genotext is are the under uh, underlying uh, energies no it is not the manifest expression it is not the manifest linguistic structure it is the text which is in the cora which is yet to be expressed the underlying energies of that text is called genotext and once it gets expressed in manifest terms when the manifest linguistic structure is acquired by that genotext it becomes a phenotext the relationship the, between the genotext and the phenotext can be the challenge that linguist would like to face uh this reminds me of uh, the discussion in indian linguistics where uh, scholars like uh, bhartruhari and his followers talk about para pashyanti madhyama and vaikhari the prelingual developments in the human mind and the manifest expression of vaikhari the manifest prelingual uh, expressions like vaikhari so it is the development the journey from para to vaikhari is very similar to the journey from genotext to phenotext julia kristeva has analyzed quite quite a few painters she has written about actually you can see the evolution of julia kristeva's thought through her different books and then she is getting more and more abstract in her inquiry 
in the later development. The most important thing in this particular context is Yulia Kristeva is one of the scholars who has tried to comment on the role of unintentionality in lingual expressions, like the other scholars who pleaded the theory of psychoanalysis.